Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here with you at the TEDx Berkeley event today. Um, I teach something, an approach to living, I call the peaceful warrior's way. Um, but I would like to set a context for what I'm about to share with you, so let me give you a sense of my story in brief. When I was a young man at Berkeley, training in a gym right across the street, um, and that old gas station in the story, in the movie and the book, was about two blocks from here on Oxford and Hearst. I used to do things like this. But now I'm into my 68th year on planet Earth. So you won't see me doing much of that anymore. Um, in fact, they've moved my books from the New Age section to the Middle Age section <laughs> in the stores. <laughs> but back then, I was focused, almost obsessed with the idea of talent and understanding what that meant. I defined talent as the ability to learn something uh, quicker and easier and rise to higher levels. Uh, that seemed like a fair estimation of talent. And I asked, could it be developed? Is it innate or developed? And it seemed to me intuitively, and since research has confirmed, that talent is about 20% innate, body type and so on, for sports. Um, but about 80% could be developed. And I said, back then when I was training as an athlete and when I was coaching at another university down the peninsula, um, I started working with that idea what con constitutes physical talent? What helps people learn faster and easier and rise to higher levels? And what if I trained a foundation and my athletes developed that before focusing on the skills of gymnastics? So it seemed to me that strength and s flexibility and coordination and rhythm and timing and reflex speed and balance all contributed to this ability to learn faster and easier. So for the first year, I trained the athletes in all these qualities. And the team went from the bottom of the conference to one of the top three teams in the nation in about three and a half years. I trained the top U.S. Olympian as well. So my theories did work in practice. And I might still be coaching today. But I was going through some things in my own life outside the gymnasium. And I realized being able to do handstands and somersaults didn't help me much when I went out on a date. <laughs> You know, and, and those skills really didn't apply directly when I got married or had children and dealt with financial challenges and career decisions and all the challenges of everyday life we all face. So that's when I started asking bigger questions. How can we as human beings develop a talent, not necessarily for sports, but a talent for living, for the actual changes of everyday life? Now, I've said a few things about my story, but let me acknowledge your story. You have a story as well, and it's your treasure, because no story on the planet is exactly like yours. It's not as if you just have a story, you are a story in the making. You're a novel being written, and you never know what the next chapter is going to be. So I want to acknowledge that. We've all overcome adversity and difficulties in our life. Now, I could be wrong about that, so maybe I can see, ask for a show of hands. Would you raise your hand, please, if you've experienced physical, emotional, or mental pain in your life? Could I see a show of hands <laughs> up there? Thank you. Okay, we do have that in common. You know, I think you'd agree, though, that that difficulty, that pain, that adversity you may have dealt with, because of that, you're a little bit stronger now, hmm? maybe a little bit wiser, and maybe even a, have a greater sense of compassion and perspective for having gone through that. So we don't have to pretend to like difficulties when they come, but we need to keep that thread of attention that there are hidden gifts depending on how we respond to it. That's what I learned. So that question of how we can develop talent for living actually led me around the world studying with various mentors over uh, more than a decade pretty intensively. And it led to this approach to living I call the peaceful warrior's way. That's not my way. It's not something private to me. It's not a club one needs to join. It's our way. Because everyone I've seen is striving to live with a more peaceful heart. But there are also times in our lives that we need 
a warrior's spirit. Every day challenges that call forth that warrior spirit inside of us. So that is what I do. It's about peaceful heart warrior spirit. It's a sense of balance, living with our head in the clouds, but our feet on the ground. So then you might ask, well, what would be a peaceful warrior's approach to catalyzing change? Well, let's be very realistic. When things are going great in our lives, and we've all had moments, periods like that, when everything was going great, we don't want change. At those points, we want everything to stay the same, but it doesn't. And so life changes. Life is full of, full of change. And so that's, but when things aren't going well, when we have some challenges in our life coming up, then we're looking for change. Some, some of us, it's enough to catch a cold. Um, and we start re-examining our life. You know what I mean. So anytime we face some adversity, some challenge, we start to reflect and look at our lives once again and wonder if we can make some changes. Now, there are two sorts of changes. There's external changes uh, brought about by political activism, uh, changing our technologies, institutions, social institutions. So there's this great tradition of changing the world, improving the world around us. And it's very important. There is also a tradition of internal change, psychological, spiritual, personal growth, where people say, you know, I think the greatest difference I can make is changing myself, and then I can bring more into the world and be more useful. Now, for some people, there's a contradiction between those two sorts of change. Uh, they say, oh, I don't want to be a navel gazer and just thinking about myself and I want to be politically active in the world. Well, I actually confronted this important question. I was walking down Telegraph Avenue in the late 60s with Socrates. The Vietnam War was raging. I was doing a lot of work on myself at the time, self-reflection, self-observation, self-analysis. I was even doing a form of self-massage from the ancient Mongolian warriors to clear Fear produced tension from the bone surfaces of every bone in the body. It took about six hours. So I was doing a lot of personal processing. And at the same time, as we walked down Telly, um, I noticed a poster about starving children and oppressed peoples and uh, anti-war uh, uh, activism and organizing. And I turned to Sock and I said, you know, Sock, I feel kind of guilty or selfish doing all this work on myself when there are so many people in need out there. And he didn't say anything at first, and suddenly he turned to me, and he said, take a swing at me. I said, what? Did you hear what I was just saying? He said, come on, I'll give you $5 if you can slap me on the cheek. Go ahead. Well, I figured it was some kind of test he was giving me, so I bobbed and weaved, and finally I took a swing at him, and the next moment I found myself on the ground in a rather painful wrist lock. And as he helped me to my feet, he said, you notice a little leverage can be very effective? I said, yes, I noticed. He said, well, if you want to help people, of course, do what your heart tells you to do. But don't neglect the work on yourself because that's what's going to give you the clarity, the courage to know how to exert the right leverage at the right place at the right time and really make a positive difference in the world. So it's not a question of either or, this kind of change. It's a matter of both. Out, outward and inward. Now, even if we decide we want to work on ourselves, where do we exert the right leverage? What is that com comprised of? Um, some people focus on fixing their insides. This is very popular in the metaphysical, spiritual traditions, in the self-help movements, how to change your thoughts, think more positively, and so on. So some work with the mind and the emotions to have just the right emotions and so on to make a change in the world. The, the emphasis that I, I bring to it can best be explained, I think, by um, describing two fundamental approaches to change, to doing what needs to be done. And the first approach is very popular. Here's, it sounds something like this. First, you need to quiet your mind so you can create empowering beliefs to raise your self-esteem so you can practice positive self-talk, to find your focus and affirm your power to free your emotions and visualize positive outcomes so that you can find the courage to generate the confidence to make the determination 
to form the commitment to feel sufficiently motivated to do whatever it is you need to do. That's one approach. I recommend the other, which is just do it. (laughs) Life is always going to come down to that. Whether it takes us a few minutes or a few months or years, the question always remains before us. What will you do now in response to the circumstances? Because it seems to me there we have to look closely at what we have more or less control over. Can we control the thoughts that arise in our mind and change those? Let me ask you, how many of you have read, ever read a book about positive thinking, the power of positive psychology, positive thinking, positive mental attitude? Okay, I see quite a few hands. Now, how many of you have only had positive thoughts after reading those books for, say, the last <laughs> couple of weeks? Anybody? That's interesting, isn't it? And we believe, of course, but if I'd read the book twice, if I'd highlighted it and done all the exercises, maybe I too would be having more positive thoughts. Well, maybe so. Um, But as far as I've looked, we don't have any direct control over what thoughts arise in our awareness. Um, We don't have a spam filter in our heads. A lot of junk mail comes through. And that's just perfectly natural. It's part of life. Sometimes my thoughts are positive, sometimes they're negative. I'm at peace with my mind now because I recognize that. I'm no longer worried about it. If you want to become obsessed about something, I'll tell you how to do it. Just try really hard not to think a given thought all day. How about our emotions? Can we control our emotions? If we could just will ourselves to feel differently from the way we feel in any given moment, then my seminars and talks would be very short. I would just say, hi, my name is Dan. I recommend you feel happy the rest of your life. (laughs) Somebody came up to me after a seminar or talk workshop I gave and said, Dan, I don't know, I have to tell you, I feel so uh, inspired. (laughs) I said, don't worry, it will pass. (laughs) Because it's true, isn't it? Inspiration comes and goes, motivation rises and falls. The question remains, what will we do? What will we do? Now, I'd like to share a bit of a secret with you that uh, how do we turn what we know into what we actually do? Isn't this the major challenge of our lives? Let me give you a very specific example. Because we all know, for example, raise your hand if you know, if you're aware that it's good to do regular, moderate exercise almost every day. Please. Just raising your hand will help the blood circulate in your body, so (laughs) I recommend it. All right, so everyone knows it. I think I see somebody in the back who was going, maybe not, maybe not. We all know this, but now let me ask you again. Please raise your hand if you do regular, moderate exercise almost every day. All right, I see quite a few hands go up, but there were fewer hands that time. So some of you know it's good for you, but for, I'm sure, very good reasons, your schedule and so on, you haven't found a time or made time to actually work that into your life. So this is my little secret to give you. When you get up tomorrow morning, just get up, go about your morning, and then do one jumping jack. And then go about your day. (laughs) And the next day, do another jumping jack, just one jumping jack. And the day after that, do one jumping jack. At the end of 30 days, if somebody comes up to you and says, by the way, do you have a regular exercise routine? (laughs) Yes. Now, we find that amusing, uh, and it is kind of funny, but of course, you're more sophisticated than that. You're going, come on, you know, Dan, that's not going to give me my aerobic points or change my metabolic set point or give me a training effect, but it's significant, and I'll tell you why. First, you've made a resolution you stuck with. You have set aside a time every day for your exercise routine. The second month, you might do two jumping jacks, double your workout. Yes. (laughs) You might put on some music and just move your body, every joint. You might, you might, uh, you know, the hardest part about exercise is getting the clothing on. You might walk halfway around the block, breathing deeply. 
You might even learn the Peaceful Warrior Workout, which I've done every day for 27 and a half years. Every day. It's a four-minute routine. And it's based on a principle that goes along with what I've been sharing. A little of something is better than a lot of... Yes. So in other words, it's fine to dream big, but start small and then connect the dots. Life can feel overwhelming when we're thinking about the past and future. You know, a writer named Barbara Rasp said, the lesson is simple, the student is complicated. By focusing less, actually, on trying to have just the right thoughts and positive thoughts and quiet mind and just the right feelings, if we focus on what we have more control over, how we move our arms and legs, what we actually do moment to moment, it simplifies our life. Do you ever wake up in the morning thinking, oh, I have 26 things I have to do today? But actually, there's only one thing you need to do. Open your eyes when you first wake up and then sit up, unless you sleep sitting up, <laughs> and then put your feet on the floor. One thing at a time. My life is very busy. I'm sure yours is very busy too, but my life has become very simple when I've finally realized I can only do one thing at a time. A young man, a college student actually, came up to me once and said, Dan, I know you charge a lot of money for personal consultations, but um, I'm a poor college student. I just have a dollar. Can you tell me something for a dollar? <laughs> I said, sure. And I, gave him, I told him six words that could change his life if he actually practiced it. Those six words were simply here and now. Breathe and relax. Just remembering to do those things more often. Remembering where we are. Where we are, right here, right now. The moment of reality. It's the only one. Mark Twain once said, I've had many troubles in my life, most of which never happened. <laughs> yeah, we laugh because there's some truth there. A light bulb goes on. Most of our troubles are self-created about past and future, regrets, anxieties. But right now, we can, we can handle this moment. Life comes at us in waves of change. We cannot predict or control those waves, but we can become better surfers. So in closing, I recommend to you, to us all, that we practice surfing, learn to surf the waves of change here and now, each moment. We can always handle this moment, and the quality of our moments become the quality of our lives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.